Today we're going to talk about Hardware RAID. So the title of this video is the five requirements to implement M.2 NVMe RAID on a Broadcom Mega RAID card. Hello everybody. Welcome to Builder Buy. My name is Gil Boyd. Thanks for joining us. I've got some information we're going to share because of those five requirements. The first thing we're going to start with is the Broadcom card. But before we get to the Broadcom card, we're going to answer a subscriber question from Joey. And this is in response to the ASUS Hyper M.2 B16 NVMe quad card. And Joey's question is that hardware RAID or software RAID? Joey, there's three types of RAID. I've been talking about doing this. It's appropriate now. So here goes. That particular card falls under two categories. Of the three, there's a hardware RAID. That's what we're going to talk about today. The other two are software RAID. And a software RAID uses the... Uh, inexpensive way, what I call a poor man's RAID, and what you have is a hybrid BIOS bootable RAID, and then you have an operating system RAID. Those two are both software. And as everything we've talked about with the system we've worked with, which is the Gigabyte TRX40 Designare, where we have two 16-lane slots and two 8-lane slots, how we manage those resources is extremely important because the first item we're going to look at on this list for hardware RAID is the Broadcom card. It's an 8-lane card. There's not a 16-lane card, but we're going to go through this process of five elements. And as we go down this list, we need to delve into some of it so we can do some comparisons, give you some perspective on how this is going to work. Because it's not just the RAID card, but it's the enclosure to manage the disks. And what makes all that work is the cable required to connect that. And I'll say Oculink, and I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Let's go look at the RAID card. We will have all this information up in the description. We've gone to Broadcom RAID controllers. We're going to go to NVMe RAID. And of the host bus type we're looking at is a BI-8 PCI Express 4.0. There are three cards. Okay, under internal ports, we have two that are 8 port and we have one that's 16. We're going to select all three of these and we're going to compare those three. All three of these are BI-8 PCI Express 4.0 and low profile. So in a rack mount case, in an enterprise solution, this is the way to go for hardware RAID. This is not a poor man's RAID. This is full-blown hardware RAID. But you have to remember, these cards are not designed for M.2 NVMe. They're designed for NVMe, but they're designed for U.2. So we've got to get from U.2 to M.2. So I'm going to look at these three cards and show you the comparison because these details are going to matter as this gets implemented. Because everybody always stops when they say, you know, what, what does it take to do hardware RAID? And as soon as I say a Broadcom Mega RAID, that usually stops things. Well, we're now in the process, and this is probably the third technology gap we've had over the years that, uh, and this has probably been the longest one where we've had access to be able to do RAID on this level. And you'll understand as this all plays out. So let's go back to the specs. All right, of these three cards, the cache size is different, the one on the left and the right. 4 gig cache versus 8 gig cache, the one we're going to look at in the middle. What I want you to know is, is the card on the right has one internal connector, but it also has ex two external connectors. We're not going to need that. What we need is what this middle card has. And the big difference in the card on the left and the card on the right, this middle card has two connectors. And that's the Mega RAID 9560 16i. And the connector on that is called Slim SACE. We'll go to specifications and we identify two components. One, the card, and two, the cache fault. Cache fault is one option that I'm going to come back to because I'm going to call that item number five. We're going to work on component number one first, number one being the card. Now, this particular card, I cannot find a link into Amazon. There are other places, but probably the easiest to access this card would be through Newegg, so we'll have a link up on this. What's important about this is an image that we can look at. And if you look at the back end of that card, those two connectors, back and forth, while I show you the connectors, I'm going to show you the cable, and I'm going to show you the drive that's required. And of those three primary items, the cable, the Oculink cable, is what makes all this work. But you've got to have the drive enclosure to house those drives to make this thing all function. So uh, bear with me. Now we have to reverse engineer the process. ICDoc has or is going to have the enclosure, and this is a page that's worth spending some time and study some of the stuff on that page because uh, what we're looking at is an M.2 NVMe enclosure that will fit anywhere from a uh, five and a quarter inch bay, a three and a half inch bay, 
or can be in a rack mount bay. But we're going to focus on the one at the top of the list, which is about M.2 NVMe to be able to put four drives in one little five and a quarter inch space. And that's another reason we like cases that have drive bays. And this particular model is a tough farmer. We'll get to the part number because there's some specificity here that we need to look at. I'm going to go to FAQ and take a focus here. This is going to be for one brand, Broadcom, and one type of card, Mega Raid, which is what we're talking about, and one specific card, which is the 9560-16i right here at the bottom. Now, there are two cables, and on the surface, these cables look the same, but they are not. We're going to look specifically at this one cable. Hold that thought. We'll come back. Let's go to Documents. Let's look at the user manual. Now, in this user manual, there are two types. You'll notice the part numbers. One is PCI Express 3. The other is PCI Express 4. And remember, we're going to focus on PCI Express 4. We'll scroll on down. This has a list of the components. That's not what's primary of importance. What's of primary importance is what's on the back side of these drives, how they connect. Now, the one on the left uses the mini SACE connector. The one on the right uses the Oculink connector. That's mini SACE. That's Oculink. Okay, why is Oculink significant? I'm glad you asked. Oculink stands for Optical Copper Link. It's a PCI Express interconnect system created by the standards body for the PCI interface, PCI SIG, and the latest Oculink 2 is considered an alternative to Thunderbolt. Oculink 2 will have up to 16 gigatransfers or 8 gigabytes total for a by 4 lanes. Pretty slick, don't you think? Well, with all the stuff we're talking about with Thunderbolt, Coming up now with Oculink, hopefully we're going to hear more about that as this progresses. But this Oculink cable is crucial to the success of making this work. And folks, you know, occasionally every once in a while we talk about leading, bleeding, cutting, and trailing edge technologies. Well, this is bleeding edge technology because we've been needing to talk about this, but we've waited because there's been a hole in the market to be able to do M.2 NVMe rate. And because Joey asked the question, and he's asked the question before in a different way, but I always say change one thing changes everything. So if you're going to implement NVMe RAID, number one, it's going to be Broadcom if it's hardware. Two, if you're going to implement NVMe RAID on M.2, you've got to have the IC link. And to get from point A to point B, you've got to have that cable. And this cable I want to show you, uh, there's a nine-week lead time on that cable. So if you want to implement this, you might want to order that first. We're going to go back to ICDoc. We're going to go to FAQ. Under FAQ are the two specific cables and where to buy them. These have to be purchased direct. Now notice, this will not be compatible with the Broadcom official U.2 enabled cable. This is the cable you want. SLSP-8X-11X2 serial cable. This will become self-aware and self-apparent as we show you and demonstrate what makes this cable so special and so different. And this is at SerialCables.com. Now in the name, Generation 4 Slim SACE to 2 Oculink. Over here, emphasis on the star or the asterisk 2. Because remember on the card, each one of those connectors, there's two connectors. But we want to be able to connect four drives. Now what's nice is if you don't get it by the description, here's a drawing. We're going to click on PDF. And that is the cable we need. One connection on the left splits it out to two connections on the right. This connection on the left will connect to those connectors on the back of the card. So you'll need two of those cables to enable four drives. And that is an Oculink cable. And that gives the connection that goes to each one of the drives, meaning the drives in this rack. Now on the back of this, we can look at the rear view with a key, a 15-pin power tap, a three-pin fan header, and of course the uh, Oculink. And there's a switch on the back, as well as these fans, one fan on each side. I want to take a look at this and show you how this works, because what you have, let me show you. Now, this is the IC Dock drive device that we've shown many times before. And what we have is a device, and this is similar, except this is sized accordingly for a three and a half inch. Remember, an M.2 is about that size and so what we're talking about is four drives that will fit in a five and a quarter inch bay so don't look at this for size but look at this for the technology and how it works as I've stated before we use these for our two and a half inch SSDs but this has a lid that comes off now the way the technology works 
the drive sits in the connectors right there and the other connectors right there what this does is there's a passive back plane with a connector right here and this passive back plane with a connector has a different alignment that is centered versus the way a three and a half inch drive is has it off center and what this does with that passive back plane it takes that center connection and puts it off center now for the case of a uh, an M.2, the same thing. You've got to get from, from one connection to the other connection. And I think these are good for uh, 5,000 insertions. So, you know, that ought to last two or three years. But the point being, once the drive goes in, there's a lid. It's the same concept. These are metal. And then once the drive is secure on the ones for the M.2 that we're looking at, the lid is a heat sink, also with a thermal pad. So when that closes, you then slide that in and you can put four of those in a five and a quarter inch bay, which is pretty cool. But it's similar to this. This is rock solid. I will say Icy Dot also makes one of these uh, that's plastic. Don't use it. It's POS. This metal one is bulletproof. We've got probably uh, four or five of these that we use because we swap them around. Uh, this allows me to hot swap, and that's been the big deal. Uh, if you want me to go into the thing about how that hot swap all came about, I don't mind doing it, but we might save that for a separate video. We did one on hot swap, but it was as it related to these. But getting back to this, and if you notice that says coming soon, and remember there's a PCI Express 3 version and a PCI Express 4 version. You want the part number that we'll have in the list for PCI Express 4.0. And i got to interject at this moment because we're getting ready to embrace PCI Express 5. And DDR5 is also coming out. And what we're seeing about DDR5 is it's going to generate a lot more heat. So we got something else to deal with on heat. My concern is, is because of what's been required to go from PCI Express 3 to PCI Express 4 using the OcuLink cable. My expectation is something uh, incredible is going to have to happen because we're looking at drives that are capable on a PCI Express 4.0 second generation of 7,000 megabytes. Uh, this device, this enclosure from Icy Dock, is good for uh, 8,000 megabytes. So we're within the spec of PCI Express 4. However, when PCI Express 5 comes out, something else is going to have to occur to uh, allow us to get to 15,000 megabytes. That's my point. So. All this is a work in progress, but this is bleeding edge technology. And as soon as this is available, this is the way to implement M.2 NVMe RAID with a Broadcom Mega RAID card. And that's hardware RAID. Here's a good example of how the drive functions. The M.2 drive goes into a mechanism, it locks it down, and then there's a lid that goes on top of that, and the lid is the heat sink. Then this complete drawer slides into the unit and locks and has a key on the front and a light on the front and it's also got a little replaceable identifying button so you can identify one two three four four drives one card one eight lane slot such as we have two eight lane slots on the gigabat trx 40 designator now if we were to have to sacrifice one i want to keep thunderbolt 3 even though it's only using four lanes so the super micro card that's a dual m.2 nvme adapter but that would be a slot we could use that's only requiring eight lanes to uh, install that card. However, we could not put that card in that slot. And you might ask why. Okay, remember there's five items. We've got the card. We've got the enclosure. We've got the cable. Memory is number four, but number five. And now we're going to come back to number five, which is the cash fault. Think of the cash fault as a daughter card power module because the cache fault is actually made up of one, two, three, four components. The battery, or the power module if you want to call it, the mounting bracket, the card it mounts on, and the cable that connects from that other card to the primary card. And that's the reason we could not put it in this slot, because it has to have room for that daughter card. It would have to be here. So Thunderbolt would have to come back down to this last eight-lane slot. And as long as we have the space for it, because we have... Uh, an RTX 2080 Ti, which requires two slots, and we have the uh, Gigabyte RS M.2 quad card, which only requires one slot. We have space in between that we can put that other card. It's tight, but it'll fit. So the question now is, what kind of machine is it going to take to do this? Okay, number one, you're going to have to have an eight-lane slot. Um, based on those requirements, there's a lot of machines that that will work on. 
But if someone's going to implement this, knowing what the price of the card is, we don't know the price of the drive, we're going to find out. We know the price of the cable. It's listed, has to be ordered nine weeks lead time. And the M.2 NVMe drives, right now the largest that we're aware of is eight terabytes. So that shouldn't be an issue with four eight terabyte drives if you want to go that route. That's hardware RAID. So if someone's going to implement hardware RAID, I would think they would do that on a high-end desktop. X299, X399, TRX40, or a workstation, WRX80, or as the other video we've just done on the Intel C621A chipset for another workstation. So to implement this on, say, like an X570, it's doable if you have the resources, which is an eight-lane slot, because you've got to have room for that daughter card for cash fault. And cash fault is cash protection for RAID controller cards. We were asked about this some time ago. A, a vendor had implemented a proprietary solution. This is now the solution that Broadcom has. I will try to have a link up to this uh, module because it is specific to this particular model card. And that one component by part number is everything. And this is actually a super capacitor. Cash Vault technology prevents data loss by powering critical components of the card long enough to automatically transfer the cache and data to NAND flash. Remember, on an M.2 card, there's three components. There's the controller, there's the non-volatile memory, and the DRAM. And this will back up what's on the M.2 NVMe drive to the card if there's a power loss. Now, remember, you, you still should have a UPS on a computer running something like this. That's a lot of data. By using a supercapacitor instead of lithium-ion batteries, Cash Vault technology virtually eliminates hardware maintenance costs associated with batteries. Lower costs of ownership over the life of the controller provide a more environmentally friendly cache protection while maintaining optimal RAID performance and a lower TCO, total cost of ownership. And the module that's required is the CVPM, which is the Cash Vault Protection Module 05. That's the only part that's required according to Broadcom. During normal write-back operation, data is written to cache DRAM. The I.O. is acknowledged as complete to the application that issued the write, and later the write is flushed to disk. If power is lost while write-back cache is enabled, whatever is in DRAM will be lost. Since the controller has already acknowledged the I.O. is complete, the application is unaware of the data loss. So that's pretty much it on hardware RAID. Everything we've talked about has been about AMD RAID to some level Intel RAID. And we still need to do a video about VROC and split that out because VROC Enterprise versus VROC on the high-end desktop are kind of two directions, one and the same. There are some similarities, but there are some differences that, that we need to point out. But all we're talking about here is hardware RAID. This will support a VROC, but this will also support without a VROC, which is pretty cool because you can implement this on an AMD system that doesn't require VROC. So, nice. So we want to keep this tight. I hope that helps explain hardware RAID, the easy way to do it. But again, it's bleeding edge technology because not all the parts are available. But when it does become available, it changes again and we move on to PCI Express number five. So I want to thank you guys for watching. This is Builder By. We look forward to seeing you next video. We're out.